my name is uh, Steve Hayes from the University of Nevada, Reno, and I'm here uh, to uh, facilitate a discussion with uh, two of my uh, good friends uh, and colleagues uh, who are contributors to the upcoming book on evolution science and contextual behavioral science, a reintegration. And so I'd like to welcome uh, my guests, uh, David Sloan Wilson, who's uh, president of Evolution Institute and professor at uh, Binghamton University, and Paul Atkins, who's at the Institute for Positive Psychology and Education at Australian Catholic University. And I believe uh, the current president of the Australian and uh, New Zealand chapter of the Association for Contextual Behavioral Science. I think it should be uh, shared with the group that all three of us have been working together uh, for some time on this uh, project we're calling ProSocial. And that will undoubtedly be a focus of our discussion, although not exclusively. And so uh, the focus here is on small groups and uh, looking at it from evolution science and contextual behavior science point of view. I've asked um, uh, both of my colleagues here to uh, just hold forth for uh, five or six minutes on the, what they uh, wrote about in their uh, chapter, and then we'll uh, begin a discussion. So uh, David, if there's no reason to otherwise, why don't we start with you? Sure, great. So uh, the title of my chapter is called Small Groups as Fundamental Units of Social Organization. And the first point I make about that is that the whole concept of this small groups is something that's obscured from some intellectual perspectives and enlightened uh, from an evolutionary perspective. So uh, the perspectives of reductionism and methodological individualism all seem to make uh, higher level units go away. Uh, why should small groups be fundamental when they can be decomposed into individuals and individuals can be decomposed into still smaller uh, units? Uh, but an evolution, uh, of course, is multi-level. Uh, biological units exist uh, from the molecular level all the way up to ecosystems. But in evolution, there's a privileged level of analysis, which is the unit of selection. Uh, this is what becomes the functionally organized unit. Everything lower than that becomes organ-like, and everything above that becomes population-like and ecosystem-like. And so, um, and so, um, we have this uh, a privileging of a level of uh, of analysis, which can be the individual, but need not be the individual, because when groups are the unit of selection, then it's the group that becomes the organism. And, uh, and uh, the individual uh, achieves a kind of an organ-like status. So this is a profound difference um, uh, from reductionistic approaches, which takes everything down to the lower level. It's actually a form of holism, which is, um, uh, which is uh, very uh, scientifically uh, legitimate. So it's against that background that we can begin to think of human social groups as units of selection and therefore a fundamental unit of human uh, social organization. So uh, that's how I begin my uh, chapter. And, um, and uh, the, the concept of a major evolutionary transition comes in. Now, this is what happens when, when um, uh, selection within uh, groups becomes suppressed to the point that, uh, that the group becomes, that uh, between group selection becomes the dominating evolutionary Force. So we can think of small human groups as, uh, as organisms of sorts. Uh, people, uh, people hold each other accountable for their actions. It's a form of guarded egalitarian. And it's against that background that we can begin to think about, about um, uh, small groups in modern, uh, modern life. So here's where Eleanor Ostrom comes in, somebody that's been very familiar to uh, all of us. She's a political scientist by training who won the Nobel Prize in economics in 2009 for showing that, uh, that uh, groups are capable of managing their common pool resources um, um, contrary to conventional wisdom, but only if certain conditions are met. And uh, Ostrom uh, won the prize for showing that there's eight core design principles for, um, uh, uh, for regulating these common pool a resource or group. So let me list them very quickly, and then I'm going to pass it on to Paul here uh, uh, very quickly. So what she found empirically is that um, uh, groups that have a strong um, identity and purpose, 
are uh, work well. Uh, they know who they are, what their resource is. Uh, there's a fair distribution of costs and benefits. It's not the case that uh, uh, some individuals get all the benefits while others do all the work. Uh, there's fair and inclusive decision making. It's not the case that some people get left out of the decision making process. Uh, there's monitoring of agreed upon behavior. Uh, there's graduated sanctions for misbehavior. Uh, there's uh, fast and fair conflict resolution. Uh, there's um, uh, authority to self-govern. And uh, there's also appropriate relations among, um, among uh, uh, other groups in a multi-group population. And when you look at these from an evolutionary perspective, what you see is that these are the very conditions that accomplish a major transition. But, uh, basically, uh, in groups where the design principles are strongly in place, then it's very difficult for someone to benefit themselves at the expense of other members of the same uh, group. So this has become a practical framework for uh, the efficacy of groups that we've incorporated into pro-social as one piece of pro-social, uh, but then there's another piece that comes from CBS. So I like to think that what we're doing with pro-social is the kind of unification that we're seeking to achieve with our volume. Paul, you want to pick up? Yeah, it's actually a great point to transition. So in my chapter, I was trying to make three main points. The first point was very much about the learning processes that affect groups. And the most modern groups are affected primarily by symbolic learning. Um, so the agreements that we've come to, the policies, the rules, the understandings that we have of what we're trying to achieve and so forth. But I wanted to just slip this point in based on a, a lot of experience working with groups um, that groups are also affected by earlier, more primitive forms of learning. So uh, more stimulus-driven learning, um, respondent learning and operant conditioning and so forth. Um, you know, just to give a practical example of that, I've often worked with groups where one person might be particularly disruptive and you just wonder whether it's, it, you know, they seem to be reactive to everything, for example, when you think about the early attachment patterns they might have formed and, the, and the, you know, these very sort of basic emotional learning processes can affect groups as well. So I just wanted to broaden out the notion from the idea that small groups are, are purely affected by rational, linguistic, sort of verbal processes. That was my first point. Probably the, the, the main part of the, book, of the chapter, though, was um, much more focused on two particular capabilities, psychological capabilities, if you like, uh, perspective-taking ability and psychological flexibility. Um, so perspective-taking ability, obviously the capacity to step into the shoes of another to understand their position and... Uh, that seems to me to be absolutely fundamental and critical to really high performing groups that they can that people can understand where others are coming from and that they can thereby coordinate their activities but the point i was trying to make and coming from a contextual perspective was oftentimes perspective taking ability is conceptualized as some kind of trait that people have or they don't have. Of course, it's developmental, it's a learned ability, but it's also highly contextual. Um, I've done a lot of work uh, working with groups in mediation, for example, or teaching them conflict resolution skills. And oftentimes you get enormous perspective taking arising just from telling people to repeat back what the other person said as best they can. So perspective taking, like all behaviour, is situated in a context and, um, you know, it can come from the history, the personal history of the person, but it can also come from the context that we create. Uh, and, you know, we'll come back to this, no doubt, but this is part of the hope of pro-social is can we create alternate contexts that create better cooperation and coordination. <clears throat> the other piece that seems to me to be really important is psychological flexibility, the capacity to move in the direction of what matters to us individually or as a group, uh, even in the presence of, of, of difficult or aversive experiences. And obviously that's um, absolutely key as well, because oftentimes we have differences and conflicts and so forth, and, and we need to be able to uh, manage and move ahead effectively even in, the, in, in that presence of that. I, I wanted to sort of say that I think I see psychological flexibility and instead of sort of 
a lot of people see it in terms of resilience, which seems to me to be like pushing through difficulty in some way. But psychological flexibility, if you if you look at the contextual behavioural science literature, is conceptualised, in my view, more as sort of seeing through rather than pushing through. It's more just noticing the way in which our verbally constructed world can be trapping us and, and, and creating rigidity. And then the third part, and I'll, and I'll finish up with this, was just we'll possibly explore this in more detail later, was the ways in which psychological flexibility and perspective taking transform Ostrom's principles that David was mentioning. Uh, you, you can imagine, take, for example, identity. Uh, the first principle, we talk about a strong sense of shared identity and purpose. Identity is very much a double-edged sword. It's the basis of exclusion and stereotyping and prejudice and so forth. If it's held rigidly, if it's held lightly, it can be the basis of belonging and a sense of community and so forth, um, provided that we're looking at, you know, how well uh, is our constructing, of our verbal constructing of the world, how well is it serving us? So, and, and that's true for all the other principles. Equity is obviously transformed if we can step into the shoes of another and see what they care about. Um, monitoring and graded sanctions and conflict resolution, they're all transformed by our capacity to hold our own sort of rightness <laughs> lightly and, um, and be able to understand the point of view of another and, and, and to hold all of that in the context of functionalism of, um, you know, how well is this working for our shared aims? That's probably as much as I need to say at this point. <laughs> Well, I think we've uh, bracketed a kind of fascinating uh, set of issues that have to do with this specific issue, but also this the whole larger purpose of, of the volume as we sort of deal with these levels of analysis and bringing these two fields together. But be, perhaps before doing that, let's see if we can bring the listeners uh, in just on what is meant by pro-social since we've moved past that fairly quickly. Uh, perhaps somebody could uh, describe pro-social as a project and a little bit about how it's been assembled so that uh, when we're speaking of it that way and not just the common sense use of the term that uh, people will understand what's being talked about even before they've read the volume. Oh yeah, uh, thanks Steve. So uh, ProSocial is a, a practical framework for um, improving the efficacy of real world groups and uh, at the same time serving as a scientific database for the continuing study of groups. So I regard this as a grand experiment in um, social engineering, you might say, in a benign um, in a benign sense. So very simply, we work with real groups, and there is a first section which is based on psychological flexibility. Uh, then there's a second section based on teaching the core design principles, and a third section uh, for formulating short-term goals uh, so that the group can hit the ground running after uh, after going through the process. Uh, this is a process that can take place in uh, a couple of days in a, in a retreat-like setting or uh, in three meetings uh, with a little homework between meetings in a workplace uh, setting. So, uh, and uh, we think that uh, this can be used by groups around the world. And uh, we have quite a bit of experience under our belt now of this being actually a great change method for, uh, uh, for groups. Do you want to add to that, Paul? Um. Yeah, I guess I, just to say that, as, as David said, we are using it in contexts that range from community development through private corporations, public sector agencies. Uh, we're using it in a large group of trainers that exist, you know, virtually online. As it were, well, the trainers themselves are obviously real, but the, their communication in their group is is virtual and online. So we, we're we're trying out lots of different contexts. I, I suppose I'd I'd add. I think that. First part is about building psychological flexibility and perspective taking ability. Yep, Maybe yep. They're, they're very closely related to one another, but um, uh, they're, they're very much, when I talk to people about pro-social, I talk about the need to develop a sense of self-awareness uh, and a sense of perspective taking psychological flexibility. But self-awareness also of what we care about, what our values are, what our goals are, and then relate that to the larger group. So as I'm sure we'll go into in more detail, I mean, one of the big learnings for me out of this project, and David's written about this very clearly, is the way in which what we're really about is managing the relationship between group interests and individual interests and the interests of the broader system. So we're sort of managing those three sets of relationships um, 
And I think that uh, the way that we introduce psychological flexibility and perspective taking, it puts the individual in the picture in a very real way that allows us to then um, have that conversation about the relationship between self-interest and group interest in a, in a in a more sort of profound and real way than we would if we if there was a whole lot of, you know, I think oftentimes in groups there's a sort of undiscussable nature of uh, self-interest. It's like you're not allowed to have self-interest um, in, in many groups. But it should be out there and on the table because it's actually the basis of all the stuff that often gets in the way of groups. Yeah, of course, that depends. And so much depends on the theoretical background. This is another form mm. of contextualism. If you're an economist and if you're in many business groups, then, you know, it's all about self-interest. That's the only, right. thing, that's the only yeah. thing you, you ever appeal to. Uh, yeah. And yet in a church group or in some other kind of groups, then self-interest becomes uh, the, elephant in the, uh, uh, the elephant in the room. But uh, one of the ways I describe the first piece or the two, uh, first two pieces of pro-social is that the second piece, the design principles, provides a kind of a functional a blueprint. This is what a group wants to become. Uh, but the first piece, but that requires change for groups that are mm. not already working perfectly. Mm. And that requires change. Change is difficult. It's difficult for individuals, can be even more difficult for groups. And so that's the first part that uh, increases the capacity for, for change. And one thing I would love is for both of you uh, because I know we've had this conversation a lot, it's probably going to appear in some of the other chapters, um, have started to think about um, ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy, as uh, an evolutionary process at the individual level. Change is evolution, and uh, when individuals change by a therapeutic process, they're actually evolving, and we can get some added value from thinking about uh, uh, individual change and group change as an evolutionary process. So you, I, I invite both of you to just share your thoughts that uh, that we've been having in our many conversations. Maybe I'll jump in a little bit. Let's, let's see if Paul uh, is willing to uh, take that on. What, what do you think? Uh, well, I... Where to start? I'm not. I know. Let you start off, Steve. I'll be interested to hear your point of view. Well, I mean, it just in you know, in general, uh, I think all uh, forms of change can be thought of from an evolutionary po point of view, and and uh, psychotherapy and behavior change, ha you know, has to do with variation, selective uh, retention in context at the right dimension and level. So, uh, it it's best thought of that way. I think psychopathology can be thought of that way, and it, and I do think kind of preparing individuals for change as a matter of cre creating enough uh, flexibility so that there is some variation from which to select and That's enough attention to context so that you can do it wisely and then mm -hmm. enough focus on what the selection criteria are so that as you build new patterns you're building ones that you really want but do it also the fascinating thing about this question right now is at the right level and David, of course, you're, notice, you're noting for the work on multi-level selection. I imagine a number of readers coming in and just hearing about contextual behavioral science, evolution science would be thinking, well, this has something to do with psychology and the rest of the behavioral sciences and biology. And the view would be the biological unit is the small unit and the psychological unit is the bigger unit. And then here suddenly we're in uh, one where it's kind of catty wampus and the, uh, the uh, individual is seen in the context only of a larger group, but viewed from the point of view of evolution science. So it's fascinating, and I just wanted to mark it, you did in your both of your comments, that as we get into the details about pro-social, we actually have to have the, and ask the readers to have enough flexibility to think about these units at different levels, and mm -hmm. to not uh, immediately be assuming that when you're talking about evolution science, you're talking about, for example, only the genetic level. Oh and, yeah, for sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, we've yeah. got to fight that a little bit, because I think that, that actually is in the room. Yeah, so that, that piece about uh, multi-level is obviously absolutely crucial, you know, the notion of um, groups all the way down and up, you know, and it actually does transform our understanding of what even an individual is. Uh, well, so, I mean, but, you've been, we've been bandying around the idea of the individual as a group, but let's, uh, let's yeah, exactly. put that on the table. Mm -hmm. In what sense is an individual a, uh, a group? 
Well, and so maybe this would be a way to enter back into the design uh, principles because the design principles, of course, were originally developed for common pool resources and the Nobel was one for that, not for a, a change method to change groups. And here in the process of working together, we've uh, felt the necessity, and David, you just pointed to it, of figuring out a way to create a, you know, greater uh, 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 openness to change, even to to uh, be able to apply the design principle. Would it be worth uh, just uh, giving a little bit of thought to that issue of uh, to what degree do the design principles port over directly to the issue of pro-sociality and as if you're trying to actually foster groups that are successful in that way and uh, what else had to be brought in and why? Well, uh, so you're right that Ostrom uh, studied a certain kind of group, and uh, these are groups that attempt to manage common pool uh, resources. And, uh, and uh, my collaboration with her, one of the things it served to do was to generalize uh, to other kinds of um, other kinds of groups. And it's it's curious actually that that it was not uh, has not really been done otherwise. It's still the case that her work is is is, uh, is studied mostly in the context of common uh, common pool uh, uh, resource groups, and we generalize it in in two ways. One is to show that the that the design principles follow very generally from uh, multi level selection theory, from the from the evolutionary dynamics of cooperation in all species, and our own history is a highly cooperative. Uh, species. And then uh, once you take that on, then it becomes clear that really these design principles should uh, apply to all groups. And, and one way to think about that is that cooperation is itself a common pool resource. Any group requiring members to work together for some kind of common goal are going to have the same problems uh, as a common pool resource group and will require the same uh, solutions. I should add right away that the core design principles are necessary but not sufficient. They're not the only principles you need. Anyone who's been in a group knows, especially a business group, for example, knows all the many rules that are required in order to, to do whatever any given group is, is uh, needs to do. But these principles are called core because they're so essential for, uh, uh, for cooperation. So it's an empirical question, a, a hypothesis that the core design principle should be uh, applied to different kinds of groups. And that's one of the things that we're testing. We've tested it for intentional communities. Uh, we're testing it for business groups. And uh, so far, I think the, uh, the, the results have been very uh, confirmatory. And in some cases, counterintuitive, because as we uh, touched upon earlier, the, the zeitgeist in business groups is often one of complete selfishness, social Darwinism, uh, we expect mm. that everyone's motivated by self-interest, that competition within groups is a good thing. Uh, the whole model of leadership is often uh, very top-down. Um, and uh, so, so in, in, against some backgrounds, the core design principles as a blueprint for a well-functioning group are highly counterintuitive, uh, really, you know, uh, counseled against by the, by the worldview. Um, by yeah. the prevailing world Can I pick up on that point? I, I, um, I've increasingly started to appreciate the language of the commons. And um, whilst it, um, it's definitely true what David was saying, that most of the applications of Ostrom's work has been in the area of common pool resources, there's this burgeoning notion of commoning, if you like, or, or the commons, which is obviously applicable in many, many, many situations. You know, any situation where we share a resource, so it might be songs or genes or, you know, a shared database of scientific papers or, or an actual physical resource of some sort. So I see this behaviour, this, what we're actually, I suppose, prescribing in a way, I have seen it as being increasingly prescriptive, is an alternative to uh, this dominant worldview that some people have called homo economicus, if you like, of, um, you know, individuals that are competing with one another to maximise their utility. Uh, Ostrom was really, as I read Ostrom, she was really arguing against um, alternate ways of organising, which are the market or the state, you know, top-down regulation or 
mark, you know, competitive market forces between individuals. And I think she was pointing to this third way, which is the possibility of creating um, uh, shared agreements that uh, allow us to coordinate activity without having to rely upon their naked competition or top-down um, sort of rule governance, if you like. So and to get back to your question, why is that about pro-social behaviour? Um, I think that, um, well, a bit, David Bollier talks about the idea of enclosures in, in commons, um, uh, you know, that the market tends to enclose things, to occupy, to steal, basically, to take over common property, whether it's genes or whether it's land or whatever. That's an incredibly hostile act, isn't it, to, to, to occupy or to take over and to make private ownership, this is mine and, and other people can't have it, to create that sense of scarcity, which is what markets do. Um, when we start talking about commoning, sharing resources for the good of all, then that's an inherently um, sort of pro-social act. And, and the thing that where I think contextual behavioural science really adds something here is in the power of the stories that we tell ourselves. If we tell ourselves that we're self-interested economic beings, you know, that are just about maximising this one little thing, price or value, you know, that, that's our only value is price or, 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 or you know, then um, that's what we'll become. But if we tell ourselves that we're, there's a, this possibility of cooperation, David's, you know, what the point that David's made about uh, that the unit of uh, analysis should be small groups, not um, individuals. Well, that's both a, a descriptive claim, I think, that it would be more helpful for us as scientists to look at, uh, group le at the group level selection. But it's also got a deep sort of prescriptive normative aspect to it as well, which is about these stories, if we look at small groups as the unit of analysis, then that might actually be more helpful for us as a way of organising society. So for me, there's a deep link between Ostrom's work and pro-sociality. Well, let me rip off um, um, of that. I think that you're right that, um, that uh, this paradigm that includes Ostrom plus, plus uh, more is a third way. Uh, between uh, total laissez-faire on one hand and command and control on the um, other hand. Uh, it's called polycentric governance uh, because you have to address the larger scales in addition to the smaller scales. And you're right that, uh, that the narratives that we tell each other are in many ways can be self-fulfilling prophecies. And yet at the same time, um, the narrative themselves is not... Is not uh, 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 good enough. And so, for example, if we told each other stories about let's all be cooperative, then uh, that uh, by itself would not, um, uh, would not work. That's why the design principles are so important, basically. And those design principles are, you know, they're, 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 um, they've got teeth. I mean, it's like, it's like altruism with attitude, basically. There's, 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 there's <laughs> rules there. They're really, Dictate what you can and cannot, uh, what you can and cannot do. And uh, although, uh, and, and they have their own form of selfishness. Uh, design principle one defines the group who's in it, and if you're not in it, then you don't get to share the the common pool, our resource. So really, uh, yeah. altruism within a group turns into a kind of a group selfishness. And so, and so, pro sociality requires not just figuring out what's pro social within the group, but also how does a group fit into a larger multi-group social organization that in turn is pro-social? So, and, and this is where the engineering comes in. Uh, it's represented in the eighth design principle that relations among groups must reflect the same principles as the relationships among individuals within groups. Uh, the design principles are scale independent. So it's, we need to tell the right story and at the same time we need to have the right the right uh, uh, mechanisms that are provided by the core design principle. This might be kind of a geeky question, but it is one that uh, interests me, and so forgive me for direct, directing it towards it. But this idea that units of selection are privileged, and then if I take that and look at what you just said, David, uh, you know, at each level, 
of course, selection at the level of a group doesn't eliminate selection at lower levels. They're, they're in a balance. But at each level, you, you can't understand the higher level without understanding the, the ones that are still higher, the nestedness, and lower. Uh, so, for example, uh, cultural practices may be selected at a very high level on the one hand. Individual, if you start thinking selectively all the way down to the individual, individual um, behaviors may be selected within the lifetime of, of the individual. There's features of the organism, you know, like how much sleep you uh, get or what you eat or what's going on in your, your uh, gut and so forth, which uh, all of these. So um, I wonder if one of the things that we're learning just in this process of forming this is uh, this uh, kind of dynamic, multi-level and multi-dimensional systemic kind of view in which at each level, we, we can't just stay at that level in order to understand it. And I do see that in the Ostrom principles, it's, uh, especially if you're then willing to take the Ostrom principles and add in, well, what do you do about the individual? But then add in what again, you know, what do you do about the selfishness and aspects of the individual, you know, like their prideful attempt to always be right, uh, even at their own personal cost, might cost the group, might cost them individuals, might cost their relationships with their spouse. Um, is, is that, uh, does that change your view, David, about this uh, unit of selection being privileged? Or is it that only when you're focused on a certain level, it's privileged, but that in order to understand it, you then have to shift context to uh, look at different levels, the different kind of resolutions at the same time. Well, to apply it to something like sustainability um, and the goal that all of us have basically for a sustainable earth, uh, in more general terms, uh, that um, if you want some unit to be adaptive, to be sustainable, to be functional, then the selection has to be um, at the level of that unit. There's the privileging right, right there. And um, um, this, is, this is like profoundly against the invisible hand. The invisible hand pretends that the maximization of lower level self-interest robustly benefits the common good. Um, that is, um, that is a, a profoundly not the case. At the same time, and I, get, I, I think I'm getting geekier myself, that, uh, <laughs> that there's no shame in this group, right? But uh, <laughs> uh, uh, that uh, uh, the mechanisms that evolve, here we're bringing in uh, the distinction between proximate ultimate causation or Tinbergen's four questions, an elaboration of proximate and ultimate uh, function, mechanism, development, uh, history. And I hope that in this book as a whole, that these will become thoroughly familiar uh, concepts. Then, uh, then uh, uh, you, can have a, you can have a group that's been uh, selected at the group level, functions well as a group, but when you delve into the mechanisms you find, that actually does not require the members to have the welfare of the group. Uh, in mind. So there the invisible hand actually comes back in a legitimate form. And just to give a very simple example, um, um, reputation is huge in human groups. One reason that people are, are behave for the good of their groups is that they're passionate about their reputations. If they misbehave, their reputations will tank, and then they'll do poorly as an individual. That's a pretty self-interested motive. And yet at the same time, it's a powerful mechanism for the group to work well. So a group can work well as a group without the without the without its members having the welfare of the group in mind, at least mechanistically. I, can I perhaps pick up on that? I um, we can under, what the conversation that we're having right now is actually a really important conversation. We tend to partition it off as being geeky or theoretical or something, but in the end, this is part of our narrative, the, the narrative that we're telling. And I think it's really important that we become more skilled at talking about the selection forces at multiple levels at the same time, and you both alluded to that. So the narrative is not, let's all be more cooperative. Obviously, that's unhelpful. The narrative is, how can we understand the, the needs and, and the selection pressures on 
on multiple levels at the same time, individuals, small groups, large groups. I mean, to put it in sort of more colloquial language, um, Adam Kahane in his work on, on helping groups to uh, function more effectively and his work on scenario planning talks about the distinction between love and power. When we privilege the larger organisation, the larger group, we're sort of privileging relationship and love and connection. When we privilege the individual, we're, we're, we're tending to privilege, you know, individual power or, or, or um, capacity to achieve one's own ends. We should be much more sophisticated at having that conversation um, that incorporates both uh, love and connection and also power, I think. And I think that's the narrative we're trying to create in, in the work that we're doing together. Well, what's happening is that we, we need to function both in the capacity as, as members of groups and also in the capacity as selective agents. So basically the ultimate causation, selecting groups to function well as groups, that's something that's done on the basis of policy or intentional planning or, um, or mindfulness-based uh, reflection. We're trying to think what kind of group do we want it to be? In that case, we're operating in ultimate causation uh, mode. It's in that sense that unless we think on behalf of the whole group, then the group is not going to uh, the group is not going to function well. What we decide to do is is something that can fall back upon uh, such things as uh, as uh, individual self interest, not exclusively, but um, but uh, at least in part. So, for example, if we want to solve global climate change, maybe carbon credits is the way to go. Um, in the first place, we had to think about a global solution. But that solution could be one that appeals to uh, uh, market uh, um, economic forces, and that would be okay. That actually might be the best. That might be the be best mechanism. I imagine a lot of people who are interested in these particular chapters in the book have practical reasons for being interested in it. Um, it could be that they actually, you know, work with groups. We're certainly all members of groups. Um, what? Uh, what could you say about somebody who came into this and said, well, uh, why would I think that this will actually be more effective than other group methods that are out there? There are certainly not a number of organizational methods and methods for uh, building uh, leadership and healthy groups and, and, and so forth. Um, uh, it, uh, you know, uh, Ostrom won the Nobel, but won the Nobel for analyzing descriptively the groups that were already functioning. And uh, that's a little different set than somebody who might come to these chapters for guidance into how, how to do it effectively. Uh, do, do you have thoughts about that? Are these design principles as augmented perhaps by the uh, psychological flexibility perspective taking kind of things from the CBS point of view? Are they a relatively coherent set? Do we have any reason to believe that they're any better a set than any of the many, many others that are out there in the almost cacophony of uh, the behavioral science uh, advice literature? And do you have views on I might, that? I might jump in there. Again, I'll, I'll probably use the language of a story, a narrative, and I'm, I'm thinking very, very functionally how, how helpful are these principles. I'd say that we have pretty good evidence now that when we use these principles prescriptively, uh, then it can be helpful for groups. But it's by no means the, the final word. Um, I mean, what strikes me about the principles when I look at them is that uh, there are different levels of generality. Um, for example, it seems to me that you know, tracking agreed or monitoring agreed behaviours and, um, and and graded sanctions is quite a specific um, prescription for how to do things. And the, the notion of equity or equitable distribution of costs and benefits um, is prescriptive, can be interpreted prescriptively, but it seems to happen at a much broader level of generality. Polycentric governance is arguably different to the others or appropriate, sorry, principle A, appropriate relations to other groups is arguably different to the others in the sense that all the others are about how the small group functions, whereas that uh, principle A builds the bridge to the next level up 
I think that's incredibly helpful because it, it builds on the whole notion that we've been talking about of groups all the way down and the need to be able to flexibly move between different levels of organisation and understand selection by consequences at each level of organisation. So I think it's very, very helpful to have it in there. Um, but it's sort of got a different quality to it. Um, the one principle that I've wondered about sometimes, and I've, I was struck when, when um, I first saw an articulation by David of uh, the principles in our original handbook, he talked about um, supplementary principles. I can't remember what you call them, alternate, um, additional auxiliary, principles. Auxiliary, design. A, a, auxiliary principles. And the one that he put in as the example was learning. And it struck me that maybe that is a, is a piece that often happens in modern day groups. You know, common pool resources and the, the context in which Austin was working, the resource might be relatively constant and the uh, response to that resource might be relatively constant. But modern organisations and social networks and so forth are characterised by really rapid change. So you could argue that just as equity needs to be in there as a sort of overarching goal or value in a sense, I would say that um, adaptability or evolution or, or learning in some sense, we could equally say that there, there needs to be some kind of principle there. But then, of course, you can say, well, that's exactly what monitoring and graded sanctions and conflict resolution is all of that, is learning in a way. What I'm trying to say is it's all words in the end. It's all a story and the question becomes... How helpful is it? And, and I must say, in the, the groups that I've worked with, there's been an immediate resonance because, and I, I, if I may say, I think the reason there's a resonance is because there's sort of almost three ways of thinking that people come into, uh, say, for example, a leadership class. So I taught pro-social, the pro-social framework, as my model of leadership in a public sector leadership course for a number of years. And I would have people in there who were psychologists and they'd be all about the kind of how do we get people to cooperate and be touchy-feely and, you know, <laughs> I don't want to be disparaging to psychologists, but they were all about the collaboration and the cooperation. And then you get people that are more political scientists and they're all about, you know, conflict and how do we manage self-interest and all that sort of thing. And then you get people that are from disciplines that are more systemic in their nature and they're all about how do we get groups to work together and scale this all up. The beauty of the pro-social framework, from my point of view, and what I've found most attractive to it, is this sort of three pieces of managing um, not just how do we bring people together, but how do we manage self-interest and how do we manage the group in context, the group in a broader system. So that's all a long way of saying I think the, the principles are coherent and I think they're functional, but I also think there's by no means the last word. Um, and And... Well, sorry, one last point, if I may. Um, I think there's a great deal of convergence between the principles and the management and leadership literature. And from my point of view, that's, um, as David often says, it's, that's an empirical test in a way. If there is convergence, that's a good thing, right? It means that other people working with these ideas have arrived at the same notions. But just that pro-social, you know, what makes it distinctive perhaps is the particular packaging of these eight principles and then packaging that with some degree of flexibility and perspective taking ability. So it feels to me like it's got a lot of the bases covered. Yeah, so let me give my answer to that question. <laughs> I don't think it was a long one. Don't be overlapping largely with what Paul, Paul said, but uh, I think I, I like to remind people what Ostrom found for common pool resource groups. So she found that they vary in their efficacy. They, there was a bell-shaped curve. Some performed beautifully, others were train wrecks, most were in the middle. And then, uh, and then those core design principles basically explained uh, the variation. Now, when we generalize the core design principles, we expect to find the same thing for all kinds of groups. If I were to study business groups or churches or neighborhoods or whatever, I would expect to find a bell-shaped curve. Uh, some would work beautifully, nobody had to teach them. Others would be train wrecks, most would be in the middle, and I would predict that it's those same core design principles that, uh, that were quite uh, explanatory. Uh, that also goes for business change methods or group change methods. They should be on a belt-shaped curve. Some will work great, others poorly, many in the middle, and I would expect uh, the design principles to be uh, uh, explanatory. And I think that's what we find, basically. Uh, I mean, it would be odd if, if change methods didn't 
somehow converge on effective methods to some degree. So uh, these are highly intuitive uh, principles. So we're not saying that nothing else works. That's not, uh, that's not the case. But uh, I've actually been very, very impressed uh, that uh, people such as yourselves, Paul, you are very experienced at working with groups. So your colleague, Robert Stiles, is uh, extremely experienced at working with groups. We have people like Frank Bond. We have people like Mark Van Vogt, uh, who have uh, uh, studied the leadership and the management literatures extensively. And it is by no means the case that uh, all of them have converged upon these uh, principles. And, and actually, when you think of the two main pieces, the, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the CBS piece and the uh, core design principles piece, teaching those together, then, uh, then I actually haven't found any other thing uh, like it. We have newfangled methods like sociocracy and holacracy that um, have been quite convergent and especially when it comes to decision making, but those are newfangled. And, you know, they're you know they're very minority uh, methods. We have uh, corporations such as Toyota that are famously successful, and yet uh, they're not. Those practices aren't being practiced every everywhere. So uh, I've been quite impressed um, at, the, at the at the degree to which this package uh, that we've assembled is actually uh, adds a lot of value to, to most groups. I'd like actually to uh, put something out as a, an answer to the question that was asked and see what you think of it, which is, you know, one of the major reasons to believe that these are relatively complete is the consilience with evolutionary theory. In the, I mean, in the life sciences, the, the queen of the scientific theory is the one that I think is an unquestioned position uh, is, is evolution science itself, evolutionary theory itself. And if you cannot link what you're doing adequately to an evolutionary perspective, my guess is there's something wrong or incomplete with your perspective. Conversely, if you can do a pretty good job of that, my guess is you have a relatively coherent and relatively complete account. And what has happened here in this project is we have two uh, evolutionarily focused perspectives. Uh, you know, one of the behavioral sciences, one from the biological sciences, and but then coming together in, in this focus on, on groups and finding that, you know, we can add things, even the things you wanted to add there, Paul, having to do with learning and so forth, that has to do with variation and selection, I think Ooh. fairly directly. And when we bring in psychological flexibility and perspective taking, we're building in some of, as was pointed out earlier, and David even asked a question about it, some of these things that make uh, change more possible and people more receptive to it at the level of the group, since you have to account for multiple levels at the same time. And the psychological level is obviously part of, but not 100%. Uh, it isn't simply determined by that level. It's part of what happens at a larger level of organization. So uh, I suspect we could do the same thing down and up. And, uh, you know, the Ostrom principles point to the, the up arrow. They haven't pointed to the down up arrow. We brought that in by bringing in uh, what we did from CBS. But even within CBS, you could probably, uh, you know, go even farther with that. And, um, you know, my guess is the groups whose members don't sleep well and exercise and eat well probably aren't going to do as any well. I mean, you're all the way down to how well are you doing even as a biological organism in terms of how open you are, how adaptive, flexible, able to learn, work together and cooperate. So yeah. what do you think about that proposition that the definition of completeness is a kind of operational kind of a thumb uh, version of uh, completeness would be? Uh, being able to fit it into an evolutionary perspective. Um, can I respond? Uh, so I, I think that for, for me at least, and my perspective is no doubt different to David's, um, I think you can easily fit it into an evolutionary perspective and, and but then you probably, there's probably a fair degree of latitude. There's probably a number of things you could have easily fitted into an evolutionary perspective. So at the level of, you know, which principles should we have included, 
I'm sure we could reframe this and rephrase it and still fit it within an evolutionary perspective. But I, I guess I want to highlight the fact that what you're pointing to is the richness of um, the theory, the narrative that we have underneath um, this work, and that is crucially important. So David raised the example of polacracy, for example, um, or, or sociocracy. Those two approaches are very much focused on um, inclusive decision-making and how do we create inclusive decision-making, how do we organise uh, groups non-hierarchically and so forth. Great stuff, a lot of overlap with what we do. But what I see in that work is um, a lower level, a lower level of abstraction and, and much more prescriptive practices. So, yeah. you know, you should have inclusive decision making should work with these X number of steps and they yep. include That's asking right. if anybody has objections or whatever. The problem is that works for some contexts and not for others. And unless you've got the sort of theorizing that you're both talking about underpinning it, then we don't have the flexibility and adaptability to create alternate approaches. So I see what we're building as a set of abstract principles that are broad enough to be flexible in many, many contexts, whereas most of... And, and that actually is a problem too, right, because it means that people have to do the work to apply it to their own particular context. They need to make it much more specific. And so a business leader weighing up what we do and holacracy might, might easily say, well, thank you, I'll have holacracy because they're telling me what to do in a much more specific way. But the problem is that may not work so well in community development or in software management or something like that. So yeah. but, now, let, me, know, let me amplify yeah. that. So, um, mm. It's really uh, important that you brought that up, uh, Paul. So um, uh, Ostra made this point herself that although that the, the core design principles are functional principles and, uh, and, uh, and their implementation needs to be highly uh, uh, contextual, back to, back to a form mm. of contextualism. Um, every group needs to monitor, uh, but on the other hand, exactly how they monitor depends, uh, richly depends on the particular situation. Even groups that are more or less the same kind of group, like farmers associations in Nepal or, or something like that, ended up monitoring in different, uh, in, different, uh, in different ways. And so this is what in evolutionary terms is called a many-to-one relationship between proximate and ultimate causation. For every functional arrangement, there are many possible implementations. It happens that way a lot in evolution and it happens that way a lot in groups. And so one, I think, error that is made by change methods is to prescribe a particular implementation is what we're saying. Um, and uh, which might work well for some groups and not, not others. So what we do is we make functional recommendations and then, and then it's up to the group to figure out. Now we can offer, we can offer uh, 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 um, guidance in that also, but that would be a menu of possibilities. So this is where there's a, uh, a symbiotic relationship, basically. We might say that uh, decision-making is really important, needs to be inclusive, those are the functional recommendations. And now how are you gonna do it? Well, check out sociocracy, check out holacracy, check out something else, see if it works. But if it doesn't work, be prepared to abandon it for something that does a better job for you with the functional design principle in mind. And so that distinction between proximate and ultimate causation, absolutely foundational from an evolutionary perspective, but I have a ton of experience that, that tells me that, uh, that uh, that's not a distinction that's typically made. People are conflating those all the time. So here again, we have we have uh, something which I think is, uh, is, uh, is quite special uh, in the crowded field of change, of, change, uh, of change methods, is my experience. Well, I wonder if that point doesn't fit in with the one that I just made in the sense that, uh, you know, part of what's hard about a functional approach is that you do have to hold off on these more topographical, just do it this way kind of solutions. That's been true historically with functional approaches in the behavioral sciences uh, in the, the difficulties that they present in functional analysis, for example, or being open to many different ways to arrive at the same point. And uh, I, I'd like to turn that into a slightly different direction as we come closer to the end of our hour together, um, which is, would you agree with me that 
evolution science has had a relatively hard time producing an, a robust applied science. Uh, you can look at applied areas and, and interpret them from an evolutionary perspective. And in certain areas, medicine and others, you know, maybe you can point to some uh, clear successes. But uh, I'm not sure if it's because of the history of uh, evolutionary perspectives or, or if it's due to uh, my suspicion that it has more to do with this, that it's hard to maintain the, the broad functional approach that you have to maintain to think about things in an evolutionary way on the one hand and, and the other hand be a, a concrete change agent. That really is asking a lot of you. And that's true for clinicians who need to think about that way, but it's all maybe true also for uh, people who are trying to change groups. So I have two issues in here. Uh, the issue of uh, uh, why has it been hard to create a robust uh, applied evolutionary science? Uh, uh, and does it have something to do with the very strengths, which are also challenges of a more radically uh, functional and contextual perspective that evolutionary thinking uh, leads you to? Well, my answer to that would be a two-part answer. First, let's look at applications just within the biological sciences. And then you get into things like animal and plant breeding and things like that. And, uh, and you find, I think, that um, uh, there's been many successful applications within the biological sciences. Now, if you ask the same question within the human-related sciences, you get a completely different answer. But I think the reason for that is, is this terrible, complex history of um, evolutionary thinking and human affairs, something I've been, by the way, writing about and reviewing in other uh, uh, papers. But uh, uh, the bottom line is that uh, it's not the case that has been tried and failed. It's the case that, uh, that um, uh, evolutionary thinking was uh, exercised from from the human behavioral sciences for the most part um, early on and is only now is being given a fair shot. Actually, you know, I'll take that back because uh, as you know, and as actually you taught me in many respects, behaviorism is an, is an application of evolutionary thinking and it's spectacularly uh, uh, successful. So I think that uh, almost for the first time we have this body of knowledge, uh, well, I should say that this body of knowledge, uh, grown sophisticated in various ways, is now being applied for the first time. And, uh, and I'm, an, I'm very optimistic, excited really, at the successes in store for us, because I think it's, uh, it's only now basically getting its fair shot. Hmm. So I think we're, we're starting to talk about multiple streams of evolution or dimensions of evolution, um, cultural evolution, and, and, and that's entering the popular press and popular parlance uh, to a much greater extent than it had been previously. So evolution was previously, you know, very much thought about in biological terms. That's one piece. The other piece that I think is really points to the second part of your, your comment, Steve, um, that we, we're not, our language, encourages us to think in non-functional terms. Our language kind of bakes in entities that have certain characteristics and, and topographies and so forth. Um, and I think what we're really fighting against with evolutionary thinking is, is, is that kind of ontological view of the world of, and we're, we're more put, putting, it's not really so much about groups all the way down, it's about relationship and process all the way down. That's what a group is, is a relationship and a process. So we're really talking about process thinking and that's very hard to do. I mean, even in the fact that we, we, we talk about, say, groups all the way down, a group, you know, we reify the group. It's not a group, it's a relation, it's a set of relationships, it's a process and it can be reconstituted depending upon how you look at it. So built right into our very language is something that's antithetical to the point of view that we're trying to take, I think. And that's a pretty, pretty tough ask. Uh, and that's you know, being pragmatism's problem, I guess, <laughs> or the challenge of pragmatism, hasn't it? Well, more and more, um I've been speaking in terms of evolution and complexity mm -hmm. and uh, complex systems theory as a 
as a theoretical framework which needs to exist alongside of evolutionary theory in some ways is more general than evolutionary theory because it applies to both living and non-living uh, uh, system. So I think I'm affirming one of the things that you're saying, uh, Paul, is that uh, all human social systems, even very small groups, are actually very complex systems. And we need to keep that complexity in mind, mm. um, in addition to these evolutionary principles, especially when we're trying to change. Uh, when we're trying to change a complex system, then nobody's smart enough for that. There will always be unforeseen consequences and so this this forces a certain a certain a strategy of adaptive change which is highly cautious highly experimental uh, is likely to be highly contextual so what works in one context is not going to work in another and that's why randomized control trials are really not as wonderful as they're made out to be because if you try to implement them in another situation where the background conditions are different then all bets are all bets are off so I think in that sense, it will change will always be complex because we're changing complex uh, uh, systems. It'll never be easy in that sense, but uh, still the strategies that we develop can be very successful uh, strain, uh, change strategies and they will be nothing other than uh, wisely managing evolutionary processes. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, when we start talking about process thinking, it sort of sounds very mystical and hard to work with, but there are loads of processes like action learning and prototyping and so forth that take advantage of evolutionary thinking to work effectively with processes and, and to, to watch and observe and learn and change and so forth. Um, and I completely agree with David's point. I mean, that randomised control trial is the very epitome, if you like, of, um, of a sort of mechanistic uh, uh, way of viewing things as if the uh, qualities of the thing are inherent in themselves rather than existent in the context. So uh, there are, I guess my point is that there are ways that we can work with process that are effective and it's, it doesn't have to be. Well, I just, uh, I've just finished reading a piece on smart cities. I've been studying up on smart cities and uh, Boston is a, uh, uh, one of the good examples of a city that's becoming smart. What does that mean? It means developing all these metrics for things that work, dozens of them really, um, updating them daily even, and then having rapid feedback systems so that if something's not working, then uh, you immediately can do something to try to get work better. And then the next day you have a new set of data in order to uh, see if it's uh, working. The choice of metrics is, uh, is responsive to needs. Um, and, uh, and so what you're really beginning to see is something akin to what an organism has, basically. An organism has all these processes that are being regulated, all these sensors, feedback processes, and things like that, all these evolved by eons of, of evolution. And our task is to create organisms, super organisms, um, and Boston is a is a, a good example of a of a of a city that's equipping equipping itself with a nervous system. So it is possible. <laughs> and once you get the idea, then I think you can just barrel forward with it. it. It's really like seizing the paradigm and understanding what you're trying to do and what needs to be done is half of the battle. One compared to some other paradigm, which is just sending you down the wrong road, and the and the more you try, you know, the further off you off you uh, off you get. So uh, this is why I'm I'm uh, I'm so very optimistic. I wonder if uh, this issue of process, I mean, we can draw to a close here fairly soon, but. Um, and it relates to this issue of randomized trials and just and also what the ACT uh, folks bring, the CBS folks bring to the, you know, uh, if you think of processes just as sequences of change, uh, you can become overwhelmed by the number of uh, processes that are involved in any one given situation. But if you think of the processes that fit within an evolutionary perspective, variations that can be uh, selected and impact on selection and retention and other parts of the system, things that can actually be changed in some way and shown that, that when they do, they 
impact in that way. So you, you go from a purely descriptive, almost overwhelming level of complexity to something much, much simpler. And so, for example, in the 200 randomized trials on ACT, there's about 70 mediational analyses that will tell you what are the functionally important pathways. And then there's another set of a dozen or so moderated media mediation that will show for whom, what are the subgroups for whom those functionally important path pathways apply. And then what that tells you is, is that when you target on these processes and change them, they are important. And what are the contexts in which that's so? That simplifies it. And so uh, I do think as we move into a more evolutionary, multi-level, multi-dimensional kind of way of thinking about things, the kind of things we've done in, in our cooperation, uh, there are some things inside the behavioral science traditions that actually could be quite useful to the evolution. Oh, science. I, uh, yeah, I did not mean to imply otherwise. So, no, and, and I know you didn't, but I just- think These uh, are priceless and uh, they're priceless. And yet um, all, everyone who does them knows that uh, they might not apply when, when the context changes. That doesn't, that doesn't um, uh, lessen their value for what they have, what they've shown. Yeah, it's one, it's, but it is a message that to those who are kind of feeling a little overwhelmed at the, at the scope and the levels, then, and it actually, you know, evolutionary thinking has a way of simplifying the task, not making it more complex, even though it draws you into taking complexity seriously, because it gives you a small set of analytic tools with which to evaluate that complexity and to enter into it. All the more reason there should be a robust applied evolution science in the behavioral domain. And well, this project I mean, in this well, book is the attempt to sort of begin to do that by bringing the people together who are used to doing interventions at, at the behavioral uh, level and the psychological level into contact with those who are used to thinking about processes in these kind of evolutionary principles uh, way. I think now that as we're talking, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of some of the uh, uh, um, uh, tragically wrong policy applications that we know are out there. So for example, uh, basically um, educational solutions that have been validated in some sense, they're evidence-based in some sense, but then they're rolled out in some cookie cutter fashion in which uh, you're not allowed to, uh, to adapt them to the context. Situations where uh, people are being held accountable for improve for, for, for change, in fact, but they're not given the authority for uh, change. Uh, metrics are provided for improvement, but it turns out that those metrics actually are not uh, the right metrics, economic metrics, chief, uh, chief among them. There seems to be so many ways that you can go wrong and that are going wrong that, uh, uh, that uh, I think a more sophisticated uh, evolutionary approach would, would help uh, uh, solve some of those uh, problems. Perhaps I could uh, give you a final uh, topic and then we'll uh, uh, let our conversation close. Uh, what do you think you've learned about the central topic of the book itself, of bringing a reconciliation between contextual uh, behavioral science pers perspectives, not in a narrow way, it's just the CBS group, but I mean people who think in a functional contextual way who are dealing with behavioral science issues, and, um, and evolutionists. Uh, is there anything you want to reflect upon just of uh, the, in the pro-social project itself and uh, uh, on, on things you've learned or you take away from um, the years, two or three years we've worked on that? Well, I, I, Paul, why don't you go and then I'll go follow you. Sure. Um, well, I've learned uh, an awful lot from both of you. Um, probably the... The biggest thing, I think psychologists, uh, at least mechanistic psychologists, the original training that I had, um, uh, tend to be individualistic. We tend to focus on individuals. And, um, and I'd always been dissatisfied with that and always had a, a leaning towards much more systemic process-based perspectives. Um, so for me, being able to communicate with you both has hugely enriched that view, uh, the, the notions of multi-level selection and multi sort of stream um, selection as well. I was thinking about um, this beforehand as sort of what, there's also a couple of very specific things that I've, I've really appreciated about working with David. One is um, his insistence on keeping 
fidelity to the Ostrom principles, um, partly because it was really good work, but also partly because it speaks to a very broad chunk of the population. And I think um, psychologists can very easily speak to only a small part of the population that are interested in uh, words like empathy and emotional terms and so forth. Um, one of the advantages, I think, of the way that we frame pro-social is that it can speak to the military or, or engineers or, you know, groups that, that have no contact with, with some of these ideas. So I, I do um, appreciate that uh, a great deal as a specific thing. But, but really the biggest thing is probably, you know, the very topic of what we've been talking about, which excites the heck out of me, uh, that, that we might be able to see ourselves in more process-oriented terms and in, more, and in a way that's very much oriented around moving towards that which matters to us, that which really matters to us. You know, um, how can we put, uh, how can we bring science into the discussion of, alternate models of organising that really privilege human caring and relationships and spirituality and, you know, all the things that matter so much beyond the dominant economic narrative. So thank you both. Well, that's, uh, uh, thank you. My relationship with the CBS folks, uh, including the two of you plus more, is really one of the most important things that's happened to me in my life. Um, and I'll venture the prediction that uh, the CBS side is going to take on the evolution a long time, way before the evolutionists are going to take on um, uh, CBS. I think there's a number of barriers that my colleagues uh, face. One is this ridiculous polarity that got set up between evolutionary psychology and so-called standard social science model so that even those evolutionists who are thinking about psychology, for example, uh, don't see uh, the Skinnerian tradition or, or anything that followed it um, as part of an evolutionary uh, perspective. So that's something which needs to be overcome. It's gonna take quite a lot of time. And then another barrier, which I really makes me sad is the whole concept of pragmatism and contextual behavioral science, that we can do science in real world contexts, uh, and that we could actually uh, alleviate suffering, uh, improve the world in various ways, and remain uh, the highest quality of, 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 of basic science is something which uh, most of my colleagues don't get. And the idea of, uh, uh, of, the, of doing something that's like that, it's just way beyond their will, their comfort, their comfort zone. They want to stay in the ivory tower. Uh, they, they're, they're scared to leave the ivory uh, mm. tower. So it is happening. I know, I think that, um, uh, but it's not happening nearly uh, fast enough. And so that's why I always have a great time when I go to the, ACBS meetings and so on. There's such excitement, there's such receptivity by people that already get the CBS part and then they're seeing the evolutionary connections. Um, that'll happen with my evolutionist colleagues, but not as fast. Well, that's actually what I was pointed to, David, but I didn't mean to be offensive when I said it's been a hard, a hard go to get a really robust applied evolution uh, science going over on the behavioral side. Just just from the evolutionary side, it was exactly that thing that you just pointed to. And uh, I think uh, uh, perhaps uh, long run, that will be a much broader thing than uh, anything CBS can imagine. But over the immediate future, uh, the CBS crew, I think, has really shown a receptivity to those concepts and the willingness to get out there. And one of the things I've said to my CBS uh, you know, colleagues is that, you know, this is very important for another reason that you may not be fully aware of, but, you know, it isn't by accident that the point at which the uh, uh, behavior analysts, the behavior modifiers and or so forth are stepping forward, that all of a sudden they're being slapped down with clockwork orange and uh, the conflation of psychosurgery with trying to make a difference in uh, culture and families and communities. And uh, I think the same thing would happen on the evolution science side if people step forward. But uh, the the um, 
therapists and so forth are used to this and they're used to trying to balance issues of values and who is the person that we're focusing on who and, and being careful and working with children or others, you know, not to simply uh, allow one person to, you know, say that person over there needs to change and so forth. Much of that's been worked out, uh, not fully, but I mean, it's issues that we're very used to dealing with. And uh, the evolution scientists are going to have to walk through that territory in order to really get into direct cultural change and so forth. So uh, we have a kind of symbiotic need here where uh, uh, the spillover sometimes, the very unfair things you've talked about of the, uh, you know, equating uh, the idea that uh, when people start thinking about evolution, people will die uh, on the one hand, just historically uh, with, uh, uh, with this, the same, that's spilling over to the behavioral community, but then the positive way, the things that have worked out since, maybe I think could be uh, useful to the evolution science community. And so um, this is an interesting um, um, partnership that we've got going. You have, have thoughts on that? And um, Well, I should, stem my, I should stem my pessimism, and this can be my final comment for this session, is that, uh, is that our volume uh, I think uh, can have a big impact this way. And when we approached the evolutionists for this volume, uh, we had a very high rate of acceptance. We picked the best and the brightest. We contacted them with our project and most of them said, delighted. it. So uh, there's a sense in which I think maybe I overstated the, uh, the, uh, uh, the reluctance. And I would love to think that uh, that our volume and these and these uh, webinars that we're uh, uh, filming will will be a giant step toward that uh, unification. That's that was our goal. Paul, any concluding thoughts on that? Not really. <laughs> I, I'm I'm very uh, uh, glad to see it happening. I think it's an extremely productive collaboration. But I'll share your your. Um, uh, sentiments uh, actually I do think the vol volume is sitting right on this issue mm. it's, it, it's focused on it like a, a laser beam from both sides and let's see uh, because I think the uh, the chapters themselves and the conversations reflect uh, what might be possible uh, going forward and people will vote with their feet and uh, and we shall see whether or not uh, these ideas which we've seen have a value in so many different ways, actually have value in bringing these two uh, uh, wings back together. And it really is a reconciliation. It's not new. They've been sort of working in the same territory with this uh, selectivist perspective for a long, long time, but to act actively uh, live it out and see where it takes us is an exciting uh, and, and, and new expression. Uh, so with that, maybe uh, we can uh, uh, draw to a close. I want to thank uh, my colleagues here for uh, a great discussion. I enjoyed the heck out of it, and I hope uh, people who watch this tape later on will as well. Great. Thanks, thank Steve. you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Tremendous.